we can get started. Uh, we'd del we're delighted to have a number of our um, alumni, friends, de Dean's Advisory Board online so that we can have a discussion of uh, the school and its current status under the COVID, under the COVID uh, situation. Um, we've gotten a number of questions, so I put the questions in. Um, this was the first. What are you hearing from our faculty who were deployed on the front lines and any anecdotal stories? Um, certainly lots of um, things going on at Boston Medical Center. We have um, about 180 patients that are COVID positive. Now the um, extra patients that are positive but not all that sick are over Newton Pavilion, which opened on, on Thursday evening has about 30 patients that are COVID positive, homeless people who um, are being cared for pretty much by BMC. The uh, city has also opened a center in the convention center that will have uh, 500 beds on each side, 500 for people who are COVID positive, 500 people for, um, I believe, homeless people. Um, so that uh, that's uh, beginning to approve patients as well. We've had, most of our deans are actually seeing patients. Uh, so far we have enough physicians. If you remember the research base that we have here, we have a lot of pulmonary people, think the CREM group, the um, pulmonary uh, uh, people who are particularly good at ICU work and the maybe 60 faculty who would normally be doing laboratory work are now in the clinics. So we actually do have exactly what we need for this particular outbreak. Um, people who are good in, in, in intensive care units and, um, um, and with pulmonary uh, complications. Um, so both the Newton Pavilion and the Boston Convention Center have been opened. They will have a, a total of about 1,200 beds. Massachusetts is predicted to peak for research resource needs on April 26th. So we still have two weeks to go if that's actual, if that estimate is correct. And we are pretty much reaching capacity at this point. Uh, we talked about having um, enough MDs right now, but we do have uh, too few nurses. So that's one of the issues in Boston. We're trying to avoid moving to crisis standards of care where um, people would like to stay with uh, you do the best for your patients, but at some point the city may have to move to crisis standard of care. If that happens, it would be for all the hospitals in Boston. We have better but still limited PE, PPE, personal protective equipment for our faculty and staff. Um, one of our alums, um, Maurice Bure, actually arranged for about 80,000 surgical masks and about 250 um, KN95 masks uh, for BMC. So that is keeping our faculty safe. We really appreciate that. Pedram Selimpour basically asked, what happens if we start losing doctors? Well, that is almost certain to happen as people get ill and have to stay home for two weeks or more if, if they get sick. Um, and we have been holding the medical students in abeyance at this point, giving them training in COVID and in uh, crisis management. We actually have a master's degree program in that. And now that we're opening the field hospitals, it's a perfect time for them to learn it. Uh, but we have not deployed them as yet. Um, this is an, it's a national standard. We're trying to hold back the medical students unless we actually have to use them because they haven't been um, trained as adequately as we would like and they haven't had orientation in the various hospitals. Nevertheless, we're graduating our fourth years on Friday and at that point they will have MD degrees and um, would be available uh, at the hospitals either here or wherever they go for their residencies. Graduation is on Friday. We have 180 MD students graduating and eight more with um, dual degrees. They will not be getting their dual degrees until a month from now when everybody else at the university gets their degrees. They'll be getting their MD on Friday. 
uh, except for three military medical students because they would lose their stipends and therefore they'll graduate uh, in a month as well. And the master's PhDs and dual degrees will be awarded on uh, May 17th rather than April 17th. We're divided as to what to do about gradu uh, graduation for graduate medical sciences. They will get their degrees on May 17th. Uh, we can either have a celebration or a fall convocation or both. And that's basically out to a survey of the students to see what they would like. The issues with the fall convocation is we don't actually know when we could actually bring people together en masse. I and mean, it may not happen. It certainly isn't gonna happen in August it may be possible by October or maybe even December. So it's not po uh, possible to know when that fall convocation would be, but it would be university wide. And, and we're training the medical students now in case they need to be deployed. The buildings are all shuttered. The campus is pretty much um, almost empty. The buildings are all on car to access for security. We have an, uh, an MRI being delivered uh, and the city has allowed us to go ahead with this. I think they think that we may actually need the MRI. On uh, May 28th, it'll be an outstanding research MRI that can also be used for clinical. Campus research is down to basically essential research only, uh, except for COVID. And we're ramping up with COVID at both the needle and um, in various other departments. Study spaces are open in only two floors, L1 and L11. The, that's the instructional building and video teaching is available for faculty on L112. So we uh, have limited space open. That allows the facilities people not to have to clean it three times a day, which is um, difficult. We have all virtual classes and events through August. Uh, for the university, except the MD and PhD students and the dental students were exempted from this. So whenever they're allowed to go back to the clinic, according to the national standard, our students will be going. Um, and we're developing at the university level and the school level research recovery plans. Little things like uh, we've got to get the PPE, the personal protective equipment back, because we donated it all to the clinicians. Uh, we have to ramp up um, some animals so that the research can continue and you have to go back and turn on the electron microscopy and electron microscopes. They take about a week to come up. Um, so Doug McDonald um, asked with some academic and research functions at BMC suspended, is there a risk of losing funding for these activities? Great question. The NIH has been given a fair amount of additional funding, thank goodness, and they are allowing us to keep researchers on grants as long as we keep our other faculty and staff on um, whatever their sources of funding. In other words, if we furlough people because we don't have clinical income, then we have to furlough the research people as well, and that would be a real problem because then we would have to pick up their salaries. Um, but so far, this is a national issue and the NIH have been allowing us to keep the, the research salaries on the grants as long as we do that uh, across the board. Um, in fact, because of the uh, stimulus money that they've been given, it may be that we will have additional research in COVID to supplement our current research grants. We're hoping that this stays short enough so that the NIH doesn't have to change their mind on that one. The finances so far is that, um, as we suggested, the NIH is allowing the research salaries to, so far, and foundation and industry grants may not. We're trying to follow up on that. Staff, we have a staff but not faculty hiring freeze so that we don't add, we, we would like to keep the ones we have and therefore we're saving money so we can uh, protect the, the, the campus family, as it were. Uh, so we're not hiring any additional people. Renovations are on hold. We did lose some medical student residence rent, uh, but the medical school student numbers in the fall coming in appear solid. We're tracking master's degree deposits and financial need because those might be different. Uh, in um, after COVID and we're accepting a smaller PhD class because we may not have the master's income to basically support the PhD uh, in uh, stipends this year. 
Um, another question is what are our top priorities as we consider bringing students back on campus? It's obviously safety for students, staff, and faculty. Um, but we will be bringing them back uh, probably in increments. What initiatives are considered to keep the BUSM community safe? Um, certainly we're following national guidelines and these change virtually. At the beginning they were changing daily, now they're changing more slowly, thank goodness. Um, but we follow all the initiatives um, for trying to keep the community safe. We are uh, putting together research and education recovery plans. We have plans for the new MD class coming in. The PhD class doesn't start until September, so we should be hopefully back to normal by that time, maybe not. Uh, but you can see we have a number of dates where the classes are coming back on over the summer. And in order of their coming on campus, the uh, third year students, are obviously not going to be taking their step one exam because all the test centers are closed, but they'll begin their virtual curriculum for up to the first 16 weeks. And then if that happens, we would have to follow it by an all clinical curriculum for the remainder of the year. Um, that would take us through half the year if we had to. The fourth years will get a virtual classroom experience in basic sciences if they can't um, start in clinics right away. And then we would add um, special patient assessments for those students that uh, didn't have as many clinical experiences as we would have liked to because of COVID. The third class in is the second year class and uh, they would do fine except for physical examination assessments that were scheduled for August we would have to do their uh, longitudinal preceptors ships with telehealth experiences if they can't go back to clinic. And finally, the first year students are, would do fine up until September 21st when they would be starting anatomy. We, would, we could do them uh, remotely, but it would be much better to do it in person. And doctoring for first and second years would have to be delivered later. So that's basically the recovery plans for education and research to date. Um, thank you, and I think we should go on to the next speaker and then we can ask questions uh, at the end. Is Nahid going first or, or uh, Dr. Murphy? Um, I'm happy to do it. I, I'm going to actually share the screen if I'm going first. Is it, George, are you going first or am I? Please, Nahid. Yep, great. I'm just going to share my screen right now. Um, thank you so much, um, Dean Edmund, for having me and, and uh, for others on the call as well. Just a short introduction. I am a, an associate professor in the R section of infectious diseases. I'm a faculty member at the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratories. Um, and I run a biocontainment care unit at Boston Medical Center. It's a three bed unit that's been around for about five years now, um, which has backed up our maximum containment laboratory work for viral hemorrhagic fevers. And so um, some of this work for us has been um, taking what we were doing in a smaller scenario and moving it out to an entire hospital becoming a biocontainment unit or, or tackling highly communicable infectious diseases. So I wanted to go over a little bit about uh, both the general principles around this and what Boston Medical Center has done. What we're doing uh, a little bit on the clinical research side within the hospital have helped move the science on coronavirus um, forward. Uh, so this is a graph that everybody at this point has, has had seen many, many times. Um, and the general principle around this is, is simply that, you know, it's a brand new virus. We do not have immunity to it. And hence, at some point, um, un unless we get a vaccine, um, everybody will get exposed. And hence, the rate at which exposures and illnesses are happening need to be reduced to keep the healthcare system capacity at the same level as what the demand on it is. As you heard from Dean Antman, you know, as it is, we are reaching we're reaching sort of the, the point where systems might be overwhelmed if cases continue at higher rates. But the other thing that doesn't come through in this is you know, this question of when, when is it safe to, to take the protections off? There are two reasons to put 
the public health measures into place, the physical distancing. One was um, for there not to be that rate of infections, but the other is to take that time to build capacity, uh, redundancies within the healthcare systems, um, testing capacity, ability to detect survivors, uh, ability to do better case finding and contact tracing in the community. Um, so I'll just mention that before I go to the next slide here. This slide is what the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluations has provided to us um, in terms of where Massachusetts is in terms of its peak. Um, the numbers in terms of when the peak is were moved over this weekend from four days from now to 26th of April. Uh, which means that we're still on the upswing of the course of the cases that we're looking at. Um, we, we already have 180 something patients in the hospital. What that uh, doesn't put into, I think, perspective potentially is that that's basically means that we have converted multiple different wards within the hospital to become exclusive COVID positive or suspect patient wards and their entire teams across our ICUs or across our general medicine, across our infectious diseases um, teams that are just committed to nothing but COVID-19. Um, and the same on the, on the outpatient side in terms of testing of, of patients who are coming in an ambulatory setting, um, as well as uh, patients who are coming into the emergency room. So um, this, this number sort of, when we looked at this number, one of the, so I'm oh, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold, hold that point because I wanna share this with you. This is a very crowded image, but, and I put it in last minute because it, it is hot off the press. This is our data. This is our patients. This is from our data warehouse, Boston Medical Center data warehouse. And it talks about sort of the demographic of patients that we're seeing, which reflect what we are as a Boston Medical Center as a safety net hospital with 57% of our patients coming from low income or socially disadvantaged communities. 37, 30 something percent of our patients don't, you know, don't speak English as first language. And so just looking at these numbers, I, I think on the, the big numbers that I sort of wanted to point out where on the left upper corner, you can sort of see that um, in terms of a breakdown of the race and, and backgrounds of our patients, it very much reflects the patients that we are we have been seeing in prior, um, prior years. We, we're seeing everybody who we generally serve as a community. Um, the other thing that might be interesting to just point out is the middle part, the age bracket, um, that percentages of, as expected, the percentages of young people coming in with COVID-19 confirmed patients are much higher than the general rate of young patients that we used to see in prior year admissions. Um, and, that's, and, and that's sort of true across the board, but even patients who are not COVID positive, so um, I'm, I'm sorry, co who are COVID positive or not being admitted, we're seeing a huge number of young patients on the ambulatory side who get diagnosed with this disease. And this is pretty, pretty on par with, with what we're seeing um, overall reported. You know, patients of every age get this disease um, and younger patients can get sick, um, you know, everything that we already sort of know. Um, the other thing that, that you'll see is we have a, a huge percentage of patients who are homeless or undomiciled. Uh, or unstably housed, um, and we're seeing that during this epidemic, and that's on the lower uh, left corner there. Um, so, so not to go into too much of that, but just to step back and, and talk about what the hospital has done since mid-January. I think this was on all of our radars, and so we formed a working group mid-January, and huge part of the work has been, this is an iterative process. What's happened is we have taken running scenarios from both national and regional models um, and our own patient populations and what we've seen in prior years. And early on, Alistair Bell, the COO of the hospital and others, uh, put together multiple models um, that looked at what, what would happen if public health, physical, public health measures such as physical distancing had some effect, no effect, and a big effect in terms of curbing or flattening the, the curve. And based on that, we looked at our resources, physical resources such as beds, our staffing, our personal protective equipment, our care resources such as medications and, and, um, and ventilators. And, and what's happened is, you know, we, you can make you can make these plans, but as we're learning about the disease, as, as, as our needs are changing, for example, one perfect example is this idea that we now know that asymptomatic patients um, could potentially transmit this disease. And so our, our outlines for personal protective equipment and need for surgical uh, masks completely changed when there was a CDC recommendation that every patient or every person on the outside should wear a mask. We started masking all our patients. We started masking all our employees within the hospital. And so any model that we would have had beforehand in terms of use of PPE has changed because the science has changed. 
And it's the same thing with new pinch points. As we move through this, for example, we had certain number of ventilators and medications such as sedatives, you know, put aside for those who are ventilated or anesthetics that are vent for those patients who are ventilated. But as this pandemic moved, you saw a big epicenter in New York City that required and used up a lot of the sedatives and anesthetics. And those are things that we had accounted for, but they're no longer available on the market because they were used up elsewhere because of an epicenter somewhere else in the country. And so um, this is an iterative process where we sort of made the models, we revised the models, there's an ongoing sort of integration of, of science as well as our own, um, what we're recognizing are sort of the pinch points within the country. Um, the other things that we did very early on is we started changing procedures around the hospital. As I mentioned, we started cohorting all patients who were confirmed. Um, by which I mean um, the entire ward was con converted into and patients who, are, who had individual rooms that were either suspect patients or confirmed cohort patients. We're now moving to a point where we're having to put multiple confirmed only patients together in double rooms, um, which is acceptable because they both have the disease. We've also done major, big, uh, major changes in terms of the flow of staff and, and visitors within the hospital. As you know, similar to the other hospitals in the area and you know, countrywide and epicenters, visitors, uh, we've completely almost reduced visitors or made it uh, very, very difficult for visitors to come into the hospital. And, and, and the entrances are now aligned at certain places in the building where people can be screened um, for, for symptoms and, and given a mask and, and asked to hand sanitize. Um, and this has sort of been an ethical discussion about how you, how you continue communications between visitors who are um, coming to visit critically ill patients and we've made use of technology in some cases um, to make that possible. Um, and in rare instances, ha allowing them to come in um, at the end of life um, and, and seeing their loved ones at a distance. Um, and then I won't talk too much about it this right now, but I, I have a slide at the very end talking about our own internal thinking about crisis standard of care um, the idea that you know when there are physical and not enough physical and human resources, um, what are the ethical? What is the ethical framework to basically um, to use those remaining resources between patients? So the one thing that I kind of wanted to step back with my own experience. So I this is not unfortunately not my first pandemic. So I was on on the front lines in New York City during H one N one, and then I was a uh, frontline physician also in West Africa um, in Sierra Leone in in about three different Ebola treatment units over the course of 2014 and 2015. And then most recently, I was actually in Uganda at the border of DRC, um, helping out with the Ebola epidemic um, or Ebola outbreak that's going on in DRC. And there are some very similar underlying themes to all those diseases, as well as this COVID-19 pandemic, which is that they're all, they're all outbreaks from emerging infectious diseases. And the one and few common themes between all of them are the, the biggest challenge with, with these um, pathogens is that you're learning about them as you're, as you're responding. The first 100 patients with, with a novel disease actually teach us about the course of the next 100 patients. And so, you know, whether it's Ebola or H1N1 or COVID-19, unfortunately, this is a scenario in which you can't divorce research from clinical care because clinical research becomes um, the baseline through which we keep improving the outcomes for our future patients, for which we keep improving resource through which we can quickly sort of respond to this, uh, to this, to this uh, disaster. Um, the other difficulty, as, as was seen in, in Ebola or other um, emerging pathogens, as it's seen with COVID-19, and um, George will talk about this, there's not facile diagnostics and therapeutics. So you're actually developing the technology to detect the spread and, 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 and you know, the, the intensity of spread while you're tackling the disease. You know, case definition, the idea that you can clinically just identify somebody uh, based on symptoms alone or epidemiological link is no longer possible. This disease, you know, really within a week or two of this disease being in Boston, it was probably already impossible to, to base it on that. And so, and not, nor are there therapeutics. And so you're in a scenario where you have to um, do one of two things. You need to launch research uh, randomized controlled trials, or you need to set up frameworks in which you can do responsible, compassionate use while you gather data on safety of drugs um, and on sort of the, you won't get any data from compassionate use on efficacy, but at least you can handle and gather some data in terms of how those drugs are deployed. Then there's the actual ethics of doing research, conduct doing research, because, you know, as you might have seen the nationwide conversation about hydroxychloroquine um, is, is this underlying sort of, um, uh, 
anxiety that all physicians have, which is we want to give something to our patients. You know, we want, we don't just want to give them standard of care. We want to give something. And so we faced this during Ebola where physicians started giving actually a neuterone, a cardiac medication and some ETUs because they noticed some animal data. And so um, was that, did that hurt? Did it help? And this is where it becomes very difficult. Um, and then balancing sort of research and response activities in terms of resources, not just the ethics part of it. And lastly, I, I don't sort of um, envy those that are at the CDC or HHS about this, that they're having to make a public health policy stance based on evolving science. One week telling people they shouldn't wear masks, the next week, next week telling people they should wear masks, but they should not be medical masks. And so it leads to confusion when the, 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 the general community or society may not actually um, be attuned to the uncertainty behind science of all these pathogens. So the other part is, is George is going to talk about the diagnostic assays, but what we're doing internally is, is we're evaluating a compassionate use of a couple of different therapies that I'll talk about on the next, um, on the next slide. But the other part is we're also looking at other, other science. So there's science around how this disease is spread. You know, we, um, we saw data from University of Nebraska Medical Center about the fact that even asymptomatic patients who are in quarantine was, will create enough aerosols that it will go beyond the six feet. We got data from Singapore that said the, 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 the droplet nuclei or the size of the aerosol it's actually bigger than the general drop of nuclei, but not quite as small as most airborne pathogens. And so as the science evolves, we're having to make personal protective equipment choices. And should we now put everybody on N95 respirators? And, and what does that mean for our supply? We're then looking at evolving science such as, you know, oh, there isn't, there aren't enough N95s and not enough will be made by GM, by uh, BE, by GE, by 4, you know, by 3M by the time that we need them. And so what is the science in the, uh, around decontamination? And so I've spent about three or four weeks, um, about uh, really the last three, three and a half weeks around an entire body of science about safe decontamination of personal protective equipment, something that we never thought we would do with single use um, personal protective equipment had it not been a disaster. And in that process, what, what's, it's, what's been created that might not be evident to the outside is across the country, there are scientists, there are clinicians that have this um, below the surface, you know, collaborations, networks. Um, you know, when I, when we started coming up with our policy, the picture here you see is the UV light that we set up in the basement of our hospital to do um, UV light decontamination. And while we're looking at another process called vaporized hydrogen peroxide, I reached out to my colleagues at University of Nebraska Medical Center. I communicated with Florida. I communicated with Hopkins. An underlying strong scientific and clinical network exists. That's not, that's not formal. Um, the other stuff that we're doing, uh, including my own work, so we're, I, I, many of my mentors have always said, you know, it all starts with the patient. Um, and what we've done is we've created this prospective cohort of COVID-19 patients, healthcare workers that take care of them, and survivors at Boston Medical Center and Boston University. So this is a basis on, it's, it's going to describe the natural history of these patients within our hospital follow them through their hospitalization and follow them for up to two years after survival to get an idea of, of what happens both from physical symptoms, you know, psychological impact. We know from both SARS and MERS that there are remaining physical symptoms, including um, headaches, you know, uh, anxiety, depression, um, and, and potentially other elements. And so the other part of this is we're collecting samples from all of these patients that we're doing analysis on, but we're creating a biorepository on which all downstream research can be done, including answer, answering questions like, how long is immunity? What does effective immunity look like? And so what we found, and we've aligned this with all the other protocols on campus, and ours is really the first COVID-19 patient protocol that's going live, what we found is exactly what I talked about, that there are challenges to deploying research in the middle of an outbreak. And, and of course, there's always the funding bit, right? I mean, how do you get funding to stand this up? Um, and so most of what we're doing right now is volunteer, but then there's also things like, how do we keep our research staff safe? Uh, how do we put them in, you know, and, and, and where do we put them in the hospital? How do we not be a burden to the clinical workers who are on the front line? Um, so all those things are sort of ongoing challenges. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the drugs. I'm just going to talk about the classes um, of, of drugs that are out there in terms of what are being evaluated. So the major classes are generally those that are antivirals. Um, including remdesivir, which was a drug that's actually been tried in Ebola. It was, it was um, 
it's been tried, it's a wide antiviral that has, has been sort of attached to for use in many different viral diseases and now has been has been used in, in COVID-19. Uh, no randomized control trials are finished. Um, Gilead, WHO, and NIH all have randomized control trial on this. Um, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, again, a um, bunch of randomized control trials still pending. A small one came out yesterday um, in preprint that, again, the methodology was amazing, but it showed some safety concerns. Favipiravir, which is an antiviral that's been used in, in um, influenza at much, much higher doses could be used uh, for COVID-19. Um, and then HIV medications, which initial studies don't really show a lot of benefit to, but WHO is still including in their randomized control trial. The others are those that are directly either um, helping the human immune system or um, actually attacking. One of the concerns with this disease is a cytokine storm, the idea that you, know, you rev up your immune system to the point where um, that itself may be leading to some of the, 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 the severe presentations that we see. And so the candidates that are out there are anti-IL-6 receptors, Janus kinase inhibitors, drugs that are used in rheumatoid arthritis, but also convalescent plasma. There is a small randomized, small non small randomized controlled trial that came out of just 10 patients that showed pretty good success but there are large trials that are starting including one where the we are boston medical center is actually one of the sites and then monoclonal antibodies from regeneron uh, again a, a company that has made monoclonal antibodies that are successful uh, for ebola as well one thing that we know from knowledge from other viral diseases is that antivirals probably just work at the very beginning of disease. Um, once the horse is out of the barn, once you've gotten to a point where you have so much viremia or high levels of virus in your blood, um, they're not as effective. That's known of other diseases as well. Immunologics then play a much bigger role. And so I think it might, we might, if I were to be a betting person, I think we'll see a future in which antivirals are used in, in mild diseases um, and then in, in um, sicker patients, you have a combination of immunologics and antivirals. Um, and then lastly, there's the vaccines that Chishi mentioned here, one with Moderna and NIH, which has already gone into uh, phase one trials, um, and another one by Mil Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Novi, which is a DNA plasmid vaccine that's just starting phase one as we speak. Um, so here's, um, I'll, I'm not going to go into too much of this, but I'm, I just wanted to say that we we're seeing healthcare worker illnesses. Um, you know, I, I think they share the number of about 10% um, in, in, um, in some of the countries where, where healthcare workers, we're getting data out for healthcare workers. And um, we have healthcare worker illnesses, um, significant numbers within our staff as well, no more than other places in the city. But it is, it is a challenge because healthcare workers occupy this really unique space between um, being the nexus through which you're, you're, they are in contact with the community, but also with the patients as well as other healthcare workers. And illness in, Ill, illnesses and healthcare workers sort of take a soldier away from the fight, but also then lead to potential spread to patients and other healthcare workers, you know, just decimating sort of our ranks. Um, and so we've done a lot of the work that you see here in terms of reducing PPE shortages, trying to stay ahead of PPE shortages so that we can give um, healthcare workers what they need, um, really quickly identifying illnesses among healthcare workers and balancing enough staffing that people are not overworked and hence lead to mistakes and, and potential infections. We've improved training and we've maintained, and this is a difficulty among healthcare workers too, we keep changing policies because the science changes. And so how do you keep constant communication and education um, for healthcare workers? So last slide, um, Dean Ant met, met, mentioned this. So um, I had to make crisis standard of care decisions at bedside in, in West Africa, you know, and, and that was a scenario that's completely devoid of resources. And, and I can tell you as somebody who's had to do this, it is something that I wish no physician or clinician ever has to face. And the, the crisis standard of care conversations within our hospitals, which initially, which specifically in the last week have increased, um, thankfully have been also in line with what the state has done, which is we take the responsibility of these decisions off the individual healthcare worker. We do it at the facility level. And what the state has done and said, and what the state has done is said, well, actually, let's take that off the individual facilities as well and make a criteria that's, that's across the board for all hospitals in Massachusetts. But the other thing that the, the, the document does is it does everything possible to never reach that. Um, including internal resource expansion, finding rooms that weren't there, you know, field hospitals, opening up East Newton, um, innovating use of physical uh, resources such as splitting vents or using BiPAP machines as ventilators, um, and getting to a point where the state says any hospital that's close to that, contact us. We will redistribute resources so you never have to reach a crisis standard of care. 
But I will say that we are a safety net hospital and we have sicker patients. We probably have the most patients of any other hospital in the city right now. And it is, it is a tough spot to be because our patients are sicker at baseline. Um, and so, you know, this is a particular concern for us because it's a social justice issue. It's the idea of how do we ensure that our, our patients get the care that they need. Um, so I'll just end with that. Thank you so much for your attention and time. I think you're muted, Dean Evan. You are correct. Thank you. Uh, and we can move on to our third speaker and then we can have questions. Uh, Dr. Murphy. Sure. Thank you, Nahid. That was really a sort of wonderful overview of everything that's going on. So uh, my name is George Murphy. Um, I get the privilege of co-directing the Boston University and Boston Medical Center Center for Regenerative Medicine, which we affectionately refer to as the CREM. So now at the CREM, we're sort of a group of about 60 like-minded researchers who are interested in all things related to stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. Uh, and that's really where the story becomes interesting. So as Dean Antman noted, our laboratory, our basic research laboratory was closed down, all operations ceased. So what we decided to do was to repurpose ourselves and more to the point, repurpose our center so that we could implement in-house COVID testing uh, for patients here at BMC. So as some points of introduction, um, why did we do that? So we felt there was an absolute necessity uh, as Nahid mentioned, to protect patients and our providers by providing the needed information uh, to make critical decisions in a timely fashion. Okay, so that, that all sounds great, uh, but the reality of it is, is that we have friends and colleagues, people like Nahid, people like one of my best friends, uh, Daryl Cotton, who's a pulmonologist, and these people are going in the front lines to do battle, and they simply didn't have the information they needed to make important clinical diagnostic decisions, and more to the point, maybe even conserve uh, really valuable PPE. Um, and so this was something that really resonated with us uh, because what we were hearing from the clinic was that turnaround times when uh, patients would come in and they would have a test done, it would be sent out to one of the major commercial labs and there would be a seven to 10 day turnaround. So this was really unacceptable for us. So how did we go about doing this? And the easiest way to tell you how it was done is through collaboration and team science. So what you're seeing here uh, with everyone uh, sort of established uh, proper social distancing is sort of the team that actually put together this in-house testing. So this was a group of volunteers that were grad students and postdocs who have kind of done this, who have come back into the laboratory in collaboration with Chris Andry, Nancy Miller, uh, and BMC Pathology, who are amazing people. So what you had is this fusion of this uh, clinical laboratory professional group fused with these kind of diva basic biologists to sort of make this happen. And that's really uh, sort of the big part of the story. So who are the people that are actually implementing the testing? Again, it's a completely volunteer organization where what we've done is taken basic science researchers. These are actual trainees, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, and they're performing, running this molecular test um, in the CREM, in the laboratory. So one of the interesting stories, uh, Dean Ammon had mentioned that uh, graduate medical sciences, people that are finishing their PhDs, there really isn't a graduation. So one of my students, um, basically he had to have his PhD viva, his defense, uh, just with about five people, his committee over Zoom. Normally it's this big event where your family and friends comes, uh, come to see you sort of at your sort of shining moment, a really seminal point. So while this amazing graduate student was preparing for this seminal event in his scientific career, late at night, he was also part of the development team when we were working on trying to transform the center into a testing, a clinical testing center, but also figuring out the dynamics of this particular test. So how did that work exactly? So I think one of the important points to mention is this, it's not a sort of a push button type assay. It is a high grade molecular assay. Um, and it requires a 
definite amount of skill, uh, logistics, sourcing, and a lot of hard work. So one of the major issues that we found from the very beginning is that there weren't very straightforward reagents in order to carry out this testing. There certainly weren't kits that were being provided uh, by the government at that point. So what we did is we, we got creative and what we decided to do was to plug in things that we knew we can access pretty well. So uh, if you look at the workflow, we start out with a nasopharyngeal swab from the patient, and then we go through a series of sort of scientific molecular steps, with the first one being simple RNA extraction. So what we did was we validated a very simple way in the laboratory of extracting RNA from these patient samples and then using that in this molecular assay. And what we did is we did it in a way where we knew we could source these reagents. And we put a call out through the entire sort of campus for people that had any of these simplified reagents for, those, for them to donate them to us so we could sort of continue this pipeline. And what I'll tell you is that every day that continues. We're always trying to source particular reagents so that we can keep the testing up and running. Um, the way the QRT-PCR works, again, this is a molecular assay. What you're simply doing is amplifying target genes that allow you to identify viral RNA in a particular, in a particular patient sample. And then what we do is we report those results. <clears throat> one of the really cool things was one of my students is actually a bioinformaticist, sort of a, a computer biologist. And so what he was able to do was to write a script. Yeah, um, everyone here is pretty uh, transdisciplinary, can do multiple things. He was able to write a script that would allow us as a basic research lab to immediately report the results into the patient's electronic medical record. So people like Nahid and my friend Daryl could get the results in a much more timely fashion. Um, so the really interesting thing was that when we had the inception of this plan, and this actually came from social media because one of my friends on the West Coast was trying to sort of also start uh, in-house testing at an academic institution. So from the plan inception, going through all the validation steps, getting CLIA certification in a basic research laboratory to preliminary FDA approval, we did all that here at BMC in a week's time. And recently we passed our 500 sample that we tested and now we've actually done in excess of 2,500. So it really is a success story of sort of basic biologists coming together with BMC pathology and really making this happen for the benefit of patients here at BMC. So if we look at the numbers of tests we performed where we started on the 23rd of March, uh, we've steadily increased the number of samples we can process. Uh, but the real data, what's really important is this slide here. So this is up to date as of yesterday. So these are the total number of tests that have been performed in Massachusetts. And what you can see is that in the general population, we see about 21% positivity, patients that are positive uh, for COVID from the particular test. In stark contrast at BMC, what we see is that the number is almost double. It's actually much higher. And this alludes to some of the things that Nahid was saying. So obviously we are testing at this point some of the patients that are really critical uh, in the hospital and often in the ICU, but I also think it reflects our patient population. So our underrepresented and underserved patient population is more at risk. And I think that's something you're gonna see uh, as we go forward. Um, so now the question you're asking is, you know, how did this happen and why did we have to step in and sort of make this happen at BMC? So if we also look at the number of labs that are now testing samples, uh, that number has steadily increased over time. So these are not these big laboratories. These are small outfits. Uh, we've been contacted by academic labs throughout the country for our protocols and for understanding of how we navigated this rather complex process. And so one of the things that you'll note is if you've been sort of paying attention to CNN or MSNBC is that what happened was there was a miscalculation and everyone thought that the large labs like LabCorp or uh, Quest Diagnostics, that these are amazing automated laboratories, that they would be able to handle the load of all these tests that were being done. But in actuality, they have hundreds of thousands of samples in backlog. So that was the major issue when we were sending samples out. The reason why it was taking seven to 10 days to turn them around is because of these massive uh, backlogs. So to summarize and give you some of my final thoughts on sort of becoming uh, a clinical laboratory um, technician in contrast to my day job as a basic stem cell researcher. Um, what's really been fantastic and BMC is an excellent uh, example of this happening is that you see scientists and clinicians coming together 
to problem solve. I'm, I'm, I'm completely convinced that when people put their heads together, uh, any problem can be solved. And uh, you know what any scientist needs to do, sometimes you have these wartime efforts where we can lend some of the expertise that we have to do things that they're doing in the clinic uh, from a diagnostic point of view. Um, it's my own personal opinion, as I just noted, that um, there's not gonna be some giant commercial lab that's gonna somehow come in with a really fast test and then suddenly we're not going to have a bandwidth problem. I think what you're gonna see is more and more smaller laboratories, more and more academic centers that get approval and then together they're gonna carry the load of this testing. And my last point is probably the most important point, which is the one thing that we didn't consider thoroughly. So we knew we were scientists, that we had this ability to run these complex molecular assays, that's the kind of thing we do in our day jobs. But what we weren't prepared for, and what I wasn't prepared for, is the transformation that a basic researcher would go through to become one of these clinical laboratory professionals. So upstairs in pathology, these people are experts. They're processing samples on a daily basis over and over, and they know what they're doing, and they know how to sort of deal with the emotional content of that. What we weren't prepared for is screening pregnant women that had come into clinic to see if they were positive or noticing some of the names of our colleagues that were on these samples and making sure if they were negative or positive. So there was this amazing, and there continues to be this amazing uh, emotional connection that we are still trying to sort of navigate our way through as basic biologists now doing this testing. And then I'll finish with something having to do with my day job. So Again, we are stem cell biologists at heart and we make some really cool uh, stem cell based models of disease. So one of the things that we're trying to do is contribute to the COVID research that's also being done. So what we do in our day jobs is we have the ability to start out with a diverse patient population. Maybe the patient population uh, represented here at BMC. So we have um, implemented and played a role in pioneering the formation of what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. Now that, that sounds really complicated, but all it really means is we have the ability to make you a custom matched stem cell line from just about four mils of your peripheral blood. So maybe a teaspoonful of blood. We can take that teaspoonful of blood and make these master custom matched stem cells from you. What we also have the ability to do, and we've pioneered a lot of these methodologies, is that we can go through this process called directed differentiation which is sort of harnessing the molecular cues that you see in nature to make these structures that we call organoids. So we can't quite make organs, so instead we call them organoids. But what we're very facile in doing is making lung and gut organoids. Now, as it turns out, when we do a lot of our molecular assays, these really high fluting, high tech uh, assays, things like single cell sequencing, what we found is that if we look very closely at these organoids that we make, which are representative of human tissue in the dish, it's, it's sort of like a subject in the dish, what we found is that they express the two cofactors that are responsible for COVID infection. Okay, these are called ACE2 and Temperance. They're the cofactors. It doesn't really matter, but these receptors are what mediate infection in people. So we know that these organoids might be a good model for COVID infection. So what we're doing, and Friday was a fantastic day for us because it was the first day that we actually ported in some of these organoids. It takes about two months to make them. We were able to port in some of these lung and intestinal organoids into the needle where they'll be infected with live virus in the hopes that what we can do is do profiling, look at functionality, and then also maybe be able to test some of these novel therapeutics that Nahid was talking about in the exact context of the patients in our particular BMC population. So I think I will stop there. Okay. Questions from the group? If you go on chat, you might be able to uh, ask a question or put up your hand if, you're, if you can do that. Many of you don't have pictures, so I can't see you if you put up your hand. Karen, do you have the questions that were submitted earlier for George and Nahid? I sent them to George and Nahid. I answered the questions that came in to me, uh, but we can certainly use those if... Um... I have it open now. 
Um, so the first question, um, I believe, was what is the risk of a spike in COVID-19 cases once we return to normal, or do we have to wait until there's a treatment or vaccine? Um, I, I don't know that we return to normal, um, even though, even after there's a vaccine. Uh, we certainly don't return to normal until, until there is a vaccine, because as was mentioned in the question right after that, um, people will not be immune. And, and so what is the strategy? And this is why I mentioned on that flattening the curve. Um, what is the strategy and, and, and sort of landmarks that people will look at to, to ease the physical distancing, right? Because we can't be in house arrest for the whole summer. Um, and so some of these markers are preparedness of the system itself to, to continue to absorb patients. Um, and so, you know, we, we're not there yet. Some of it is, is ensuring that we get a higher amount of testing of general pub, of population. Some of it is making sure that our serological assays are up and, up and running to make sure that we test for people who might be immune to get a better idea uh, of what percentage of patients may already have gotten this disease and not realize that. The trouble is, you know, is serology testing enough of a marker to say somebody's immune. You might have neutralizing antibodies, but we don't know. We think it means it, that means that you, you are immune, but we don't know that for sure. Um, and, and prior data from MERS and SARS says that, you know, if you, even if you have that immunity, it's probably about a year, a year and a half. If not, it's not lifetime. Um, but then there's a study from Heisenberg in Germany that showed from last week that 14% of the people, when they tested everybody for serologies, only 14% of their people are actually uh, immune. And so if that's the case, then if we open up, let's say we test everybody by end of May and we discover that 15% of the people are immune. You know, that means a lot of people out in society will still be not immune. But let's, let's forward to next fall. You know, I used this example before, but let's even look at like um, anything, you know, Bon Jovi concert in, in Madison Square Garden. If, if we had 30% immunity by then, that means two out of three people will still be you know, vulnerable to this. And so I foresee that we, we, we open up business and the, the opened business sort of theme looks different than usual, which is fewer people in a particular space, you know, business at a distance, um, alterations in the way business is done. And then even then, until we, there is a vaccine, I foresee that there's going to be limitations on travel as well as number of people who can gather in any one space. Uh, but again, you know, nobody knows for sure. So we have a couple of other questions coming in from David Edelstein to everyone. Uh, what's the sensitivity and specificity of these tests? What's the different approaches to testing given variable results? Yeah, so this is a question that I'm asked quite often and everyone in the media asks that a lot because there's a lot of uh, sort of chatter about the test overall. The, this is the uh, RNA-based qPCR molecular test that maybe you have something like 30% false negatives. And what I always say, and what I think is important to keep in mind, is that when you swab someone, that is a single point in time, a single point in their trajectory of infection. That could be at the very beginning or the very end. Also, other variables are like, how was the swabbing done? Was it left in there long enough? You know, what is the sort of uh, amount of time it takes for you to turn that test around? And then does that actually reflect the current sort of life cycle of the viral amplification in the patient, right? So what I like to think of and what I think are um, important factors are simply the predictive nature of the test, whether a patient is negative or positive. Um, where all of these questions come from are from a JAMA paper that came out a couple weeks ago. And me as an academic, it's a little bit scary and I'm sure Nahid feels the same way. There's lots of studies that are coming out that are maybe not uh, controlled effectively enough and certainly not done on enough patients. But in this JAMA article, what it showed is that from the common NP swabs that are used, maybe you only had about 60% uh, sort of accuracy there based on that swabbing, right? So if you take that number, uh, and then you assume that your test, our, we feel our test is very reliable and very accurate, say it's 97% accurate, right? Uh, and then you assume maybe there's a 50-50 chance the patient uh, actually is infected. If you crunch all those numbers together, that's where you come up with the sort of 30% false negative uh, sort of part. So I think the main point is the assay is not a talisman. Uh, we run a very, very accurate molecular assay uh, where one of the other things to consider is sort of the level of detection. Um, and certain assays have higher or lower levels, but if someone is positive generally, most of the assays can determine that. So it's not a, it's not a talisman that's gonna tell you everything, but I think in general, the assay is excellent in, in being able to identify whether or not there is viral RNA in a particular subject. 
Thank you. The next question is from Shamim Dahod. Dr. Dahod, is there any relation between BCG vaccine and protection towards COVID-19? Who wants to take this one? No, no strong evidence. The kind of studies that are out there, many of them are preprint, and some of them that are done, actually, they're all correlative studies. You know, they look at the spread of BCG coverage. By the way, I hope that turns out to be true because I got a BCG vaccine as a child, but like it's only correlative. You know, it's only sort of looking at the incidence in low and middle income countries with large sort of BCG coverage and saying, oh, look, there aren't enough cases, but you know, take that into account. Take into account that most of those places don't actually have good testing capacity. And now we're actually, now that they are starting to get set up, we're seeing increased number of cases in those areas. There might be other reasons you may not see high number of cases. I haven't seen a convincing argument in terms of a biological plausibility for why that would work um, as a vaccine, um, at least not one that's convinced me. And then um, the other is there are randomized controlled trials. So, you know, if there is a correlation and if there's actually a relationship between the two, we'll see that out of the randomized controlled trials. Okay. From uh, Heidi Adelnati uh, to everybody, uh, I'm an ICU physician. Daryl Cotton was my fellow. Smile. Uh, we have Patients with, we have patients with negative nasopharyngeal swab tests, but positive endotracheal at lower respiratory samples. So when using the same assay, do sites of specimen acquisition matter? That's a fantastic question, and the answer is yes. So we've seen some really interesting things. So me as a basic scientist, it's a super interesting dynamic. So what we can sometimes see is a patient will be inconclusive. So that doesn't mean there's a technical failure in the assay. It just means maybe they have some viral load, but it's right below the level of detection. So what we always recommend is that someone do a longitudinal swab, maybe wait 24 to 48 hours, and then lots of times you'll see that second swab come up as positive. Also, the site matters. So some studies have shown deep respiratory samples, things like uh, bronchial alveolar lavage or sputum samples, deep respiratory samples, might be sites of localized viral infection. And so what we've seen is, um, patients who have multiple NP swabs that'll show up negative, but then when we look at tracheal aspirate or something deeper like sputum, you do see positivity. So that's, that's again where some of those false negatives can come from, where someone probably is competently infected, but you only see it at a particular site when you look really hard. Let's see, will someone please address how COVID-19 has amplified underlying healthcare disparities and structural racism pervasive in the United States? From Dr. Amelia Benjamin. Yeah, we we can talk. I can talk about it from Boston Medical Center's perspective. You know, I, I think that as I've seen data from Louisiana, I've seen data from Chicago about higher rates of patients, higher rates of death among African American patients, and so the you know the. The, the whole combination in general of, of access to healthcare, um, access to insurance, access to general sort of um, the whole known phenomenon of food deserts, ability to actually maintain a healthy diet and, you know, and lack of comorbidities or increase their rates of comorbidities. Um, and all those things, in addition to that, there being sort of a structural racism component just in terms of access to care that studies that we've seen in terms of, you know, patients that get taken for intervention versus not. But beyond that, you know, what we're seeing is we are a safety net hospital. Um, and so we are seeing a lot of our patients sort of come in with these comorbidities and be at higher risk. But at the same time, what we're seeing is we, um, we don't have the same kind of access to medical therapeutics. Uh, BMC at this point has been turned down for every randomized control trial we've tried to be a site for. Um, and so what generally happens is, you know, you look at a randomized control trial as a research, if you're the company that's, that's moving it. And so you look around to spread your geographical sites and you pick the places that have, you know, uh, the flashy names, I'm sorry to say this, are more resources. And so a safety net hospital is not something that you'd potentially consider as your first site. But we've basically not had any access to remdesivir um, and compassionate use for remdesivir as well as a lot of the other drugs that are out there that are being studied has been closed. So we can't even access a lot of these drugs in a randomized control trial. So that's, that's an example of sort of underlying, you know, structural violence, again, that plays out in terms of access to research that might also impact um, sort of the equity. Also, same thing with, you know, we've been so lucky for our donors and others from Boston Medical Center and Boston University, but um, 
the Patriot plane, BMC hasn't seen any personal protective equipment from that as of like last weekend. Uh, majority of it went to other sites. Part of this was um, initially when there were patients in the city, they were at places that had testing, greater testing capacity. They were able to show that they had a lot more patients. Once our testing capacity got set up, we, we're now sort of seeing we have the most number of patients, but early, early centers that showed large, larger census of patients got majority of the resources. From Doug McDonald, Dr. McDonald, uh, does the BMC PCR test use the same primers as other commercial tests? And is BMC making their test available to other clinical centers? Another great question. So um, I'm not trying to sort of uh, say anything negative about the federal government, but the CDC kind of dropped the ball a bit at the beginning. So what we did is we knew that we wanted something we could source uh, effectively for a long period of time. So we started using the WHO primer set. So these, uh, like many tests, are targeted to the nucleocapsid region of the virus. Uh, since that time, we've also onboarded a multiplexing assay. It simply means that we could run uh, sort of more samples in a, a, a smaller number of plates. Uh, and those add on some of the other genes, which are sort of the spike uh, protein gene, and then also something called ORF1AB. Um, the other really cool thing, one of the philosophies at the CREM is something we refer to as open source biology. So we give away everything we know in our day jobs, all of our protocols, reagents, those stem cell lines that I noted, uh, we give them away to everyone for free of charge to the entire scientific community. And we've done the same thing with the data that I showed you, uh, but also with our protocols on our website right now, you can click on our website and see the protocol that we use our emergency use authorization that we use to get preliminary FDA approval. We've all already distributed that all over the United States, to Canada, to Brazil, uh, to actually Dubai as well a couple of days ago. So that's, it's a big part of sharing. And uh, there are Slack networks where academic labs, it's really cool to see academic labs sort of standing up and basic researchers and kind of having this uh, sort of underground collective to bring up testing where everybody's sharing ideas and ways they did it to sort of get through the red tape and make it happen. Is there any other questions? We're at five o'clock, 5.03. I know that we're, ah, let's see. Bigger picture question coming in from Dr. Abdel Hardy. Um, bigger picture question, how do we address social determinants of health at its roots? How can we in healthcare collaborate with schools, uh, urban planners, farmers, food supply chains to change outcomes for future generations? Who wants to take that one? I, I would like to, to hope that the COVID epidemic may have made some people consider how intertwined we all are, how someone else's health has a direct impact on our health, and how our medical care system perhaps wasn't, wasn't exactly designed uh, to take care of all of us or even any of us in this particular um, epidemic and perhaps we will have more um, research and more emphasis on putting together a, a really decent healthcare system uh, for all that would um, actually provide better healthcare uh, at, a, at probably a lower price. We know that uh, current healthcare has an overhead of about 30%. If you took the 30% off the healthcare, we would actually have healthcare at about the same price as other developed countries have. So it's, it's not like this has to be more expensive than our current expenses. Um, but that's for another, that's for another um, discussion of um, health that I think that this group could, could very easily have. Other questions on COVID before we end? Thank you very much. Let's uh, big hand, even though they can't hear it, for our two uh, panelists. Thank you very much. And perhaps we'll organize another one uh, with more questions from the group. If you just let us know what your questions are, we can easily um, tell you what's happening and, and answer all of your questions. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.